start since we're running a little bit late. Um, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to this session. Um, I know it's the it's near the end of the sessions. So there's a lot of really great stuff going on, so I, I'm very honored. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you because this is my first Scratch conference, and I've been so happy with it. Uh, it's been really great uh, getting to meet some of you. Um, it's a really fantastic community, and I'm excited about coming back next next time, even if I'm not talking, to, uh, to check it out. Um, and I also just wanted to say one thing. Um, Compared to some of the talks I've seen, uh, this one might be a bit technical because um, I'm a programmer, and you know I was take, kind of taking on this project from a very technical angle. So, uh, excuse me if it gets too technical at moments, and hopefully I can, maybe we can find some way to to, to go through it uh, despite that, um, and save some time at questions. Uh, save some save some time for questions at the end if you want more technical detail, which I'll be happy to give you. All right, so. Um, this, this talk is called Lessons Learned, Making a Visual Programming Language to Remix Open Source Games. Um, and the project is called uh, Redwire. So in the game development community, there's this um, type of uh, talk that people give called a postmortem. Or sometimes it's, a, it's not a talk. It can be also be a, an article. And basically, they kind of take apart the creation of a game. Uh, and I sort of modeled this talk on that set of ideas. So I'm going to be kind of try to be brutally honest about what worked and what didn't in this project. Um, so I'll be pr probably a little more self-critical than you would normally be uh, in a, in a, if I was trying to like sell you on this, on this project or something like that. Um, so I'm going to start by, by talking about what we built and why we did it, um, the design behind it, um, and basically what we learned when we, when we tried it out. Uh, and finally, some kind of you know, ideas for what a future version might look like. OK, so um, before we go further, um, uh, so my name is Jesse Himmelstein. I'm a researcher at the CRI in Paris. Uh, so it's a center for inter interdisciplinary research. Uh, we do a lot of things involving kind of exploring new pedagogical techniques, uh, trying to find new ways to teach, teaching through research, teaching through play. Uh, and I run the game lab there. And so at the game lab, we create games, usually with researchers or with teachers. Um, we also well, we teach as well uh, game design. And we finally have this whole kind of community angle. We have a club called the Game Idee, uh, that's based in Paris, where we kind to get speakers to come in and talk about video game development. Um, and we also run uh, a, a game fair, all a game festival all about scientific games called the iGamer. And finally, I run the, uh, the there's, an, there's a really great uh, open source conference that's in Brussels called FOSDEM. And if you're into open source, I highly recommend you go there. It's really great. Uh, with with, uh, with uh, Jens earlier, we were kind of comparing it to the Bordeaux, con to the Scratch conference in some ways. It's kind of very informal, a lot of fun, a lot of people who are really passionate about open source. Uh, so that's usually every year around uh, in, in February in Brussels. Uh, and I run kind of the, there's one room dedicated to, to game development. All right, so into the, into what, 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 what are we here for? So basically, the, the, goal of this, um, the, the goal of this project was to try to find a way to improve the video game development process, and specifically for games around uh, teaching and teaching science or participating in science. So we came at this from something called citizen science. Uh, and if you don't know what citizen science is, it's basically uh, I guess everyday people or non-professional scientists uh, participating in scientific research. So sometimes that's education, but often it's in fact um, helping the scientists by doing some kind of some part of the work that the scientists are basically too overwhelmed to to do, and they can't figure out a good way to have computers do it. Um, so, uh, for example, these examples on, on the bottom, these are like some of the more successful uh, citizen science games. So one called Fold It, where uh, built at the University of Washington, where People actually do protein folding, which apparently is a very, very difficult problem even for a computer to solve. And people can do it because they have visual visual skills that a computer is harder to, to get to do. Um, and basically, when we started this project, we said, well, you know, there's all these fantastic citizen science games, and there's lots of scientists who have even more ideas, but they're not getting done. And often they're not getting done because there's a technical barrier that, that's too high. Because video game development just takes a really long time. It's really hard. It's really complex. Uh, there's lots of performance constraints. There's lots of uh, usability constraints. And, um, and in general, there's a lot of everything has to do with interactivity is very difficult, I'm sure. In the Scratch community, you know, you know what that's like if you try to get people to play a game and, you know, oh, what, uh, they didn't do what I expected. There's, it's a very iterative process. It's very long. Um, and so we thought it would be cool if we could find a better way that you build on each other's work. OK, so this seems like a fairly simple thing, right? Um, building on each other's work. We, we probably do that all the time in computer science. But in fact, when we looked at it in more detail, we realized that there's not, there are some common approaches, but they're kind of, um, they, they weren't really satisfactory to us. So 
Uh, probably the most common thing we do in, 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 uh, in computer programming is kind of a layered approach, where like we have, usually we call them libraries, they're kind of sitting at the bottom, uh, and we're kind of reusing them directly. So for example, in this, like an example game, maybe we're reusing a physics library that you know, has objects uh, colliding off each other. We have graphics to show something on the screen. Maybe we're reusing sound libraries that somebody's built. Uh, and that's great, but if when you're building a game, you might build like a, some kind of intermediate system that's like an animation system that uses all those things, uses the physics, uses the graphics, but um, we can't reuse that part very easily because that middle layer you can only use if you're using all the other parts below it. It becomes, it becomes really tight and it becomes difficult to separate them out. Um, and in a similar, there's another type of approach that's a little more like a template type of approach that so people say, oh, you know, if other people want to make games exactly like this, then I can just kind of provide them kind of a fill in the blank template where they just kind of change the bits that, uh, that they need. So, you know, we'll set the background color, you know, there'll be an option for what the background color is. So if you want to change just the background color, that's okay. But if you want to do something a lot more uh, sophisticated, it can get difficult. Um, and, um, and finally, the whole forking approach, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. In Scratch, you can remix other projects by taking a project and making your own copy of it and changing it. And that's really great. And we, we actually use that also in Redwire. It's also very popular in the open source community on sites like GitHub that kind of really uh, encourage you to, to copy a project and fork a project. But there's a little bit of limitation to that too. So you can start with an existing project and fork it and that's awesome. But if you try to bring in another thing from outside, if you try to mix in another project people's done, you're kind of back to square one. Like you're back with that layering approach. If it's a library that you can fit below it, that's okay. But if there's some kind of conflict with what you're doing, you're kind of stuck. All right. So uh, we tried to take inspiration from like remixing uh, that's done often in, you know, more like artistic areas such as, um, well, such as, you know, scratching, like such as like DJs or, you know, video DJs where they're taking media from different sources and they're mixing them together, right? Uh, so we thought, okay, so they can do it there, but obviously there's a difference between like a media like video or like, um, or like audio from computer code, right? Because computer code, there's something else going on. There's this interaction, there's events, there's lots of um, communication going on in between the things. And that, that you don't really have so much in a, you know, in a static medium like, like audio or, or video. So we took a closer look and we got a lot of inspiration from electronics. So I don't know how many people here play with you know, electronics. I'm not actually like a very sophisticated electrical engineer. But what, what's really great when you're learning electronics is you, is you play with these things like breadboards where you can easily stick wires together. Uh, you know, you have like a bunch of pins and the whole row of pins will be electrically connected. So you can basically plug in uh, pretty much everything and connect it up. Okay, so this is going to be a simplification for uh, you know people who really know their electronics. Obviously, it doesn't always work this easily, but this is kind of the inspiration that we took. We realized there are kind of like four properties that we really liked about this kind of approach. One is that you can connect pretty much everything to anything. So you can take any particular component, hook it up with a wire or stick it into a pin, and there you go. You hooked it up to another component. Um, you can replace parts. So you can kind of you know literally like take one out. Take one chip out. I mean, maybe, maybe you like me. You kind of, you know, flip the polarity and you busted the chip, and that's why you need to replace it. But maybe you have some other reason, like you have a new chip you want to try, or you have a new design, and you want to. What happens if I change the value of this resistor or something? So you can take one out and plug it in. Um, you can measure. So this, you know, electronics. Maybe you're doing it with like a multimeter or an oscilloscope or something like that. And finally, and I think this part's super interesting, is tracing. So when I mean tracing, I mean Especially if a circuit's like this, like built out on a breadboard, you can look at it and like follow it with your finger and more or less figure out what's connected to what. Um, and if you think of these four properties uh, and you compare it to how we program, they don't usually work out so well, in fact. Um, so I'm going to talk here about imperative programming, which is, you know, what's, what Scratch uses and what most of the programming languages that people use for games uses this uh, kind of approach. So if you think about you know, connecting and replacing parts, this often doesn't work because you have incompatible data types. So I don't know how much that's the case in Scratch, but in a lot of programming languages, very quickly you get these data types that are very specific and you can't just like flip one out. You can't just ex exchange between one to another. Um, you can have the functions that don't take the same parameters and some kind of issues with APIs, stuff like that. And this issue with state that um, probably won't get into too much detail here, but basically if you have some part of your program that, you know, basically storing like the memory of your program, what's going on, and then you mix in some other part that assumes that 
the program is in some other state, you can get these confusions and, they don't, and the remixing will not work out very well. You have to take a lot of care that like, oh, everything is in the same state as it would be in this other program. Um, in terms of measuring and tracing, we also run into issues like uh, when you're measuring something, well, the memory on your computer can be changing all the time, right? You know, you're, you're, I know in Scratch, maybe you're moving sprites across the screen or you're, you're doing things like that where the, the state of your program is changing all the time. It can be really hard to figure out, oh, there's a problem only when this thing, particular thing happens because that thing is now gone. Like, you know, it's in the past and, and it's, if you manage to catch it with a debugger, you're, you're very lucky. Um, we also can run into systems where you have lots of things that are interconnected in very complicated ways. Um, and object-oriented program is particularly problematic for that. And event systems as well is difficult. So um, there's this guy named Rich Hickey who invented a programming language called Clojure that I've got a lot of inspiration from. He's really great. And if you're interested in uh, technical, very technical programming talks, but really fantastic, I really highly recommend his talks as well. Um, he, want, he made one called Simple Made Easy that's available online. That's really great. He kind of lays out like what makes a program simple. And, he, and, and the way he defines simplicity is very interesting. He says like, if you compare it to like threads that are running and that you can braid them together to make a program. So like each thread, you can think of it as like a, a component of your program or a part of your program or some kind of aspect of it. And basically every time you, you have to get these different parts to work together, you're kind of braiding them together. You're making these knots. And when you make these knots, although it may be very pretty if it's like a physical braid, you're creating this problem because if you want to like pull one out again, like if you wanted, oh, I really love that game and I love the way that character jumped. I just want that character and the way he jumped. I want to bring it out. Well, in fact, you, you'd find if you started tugging on it that it's connected to all these other things. It's, it's tied in there. It's a little bit like combing hair that's like very knotted. Right? You, you end up with like, oh, everything's, everything's stuck together. And so his ideas um, that he lays out in, in, and he actually put into his, his own programming language that's called Clojure, he kind of takes approaches that avoids these kind of problems. And um, without going into detail, you know, we, we use a lot of those, those ideas. And a final bit of, of related work, it comes, comes with data flow. So I don't know how many people are familiar with this. It's another alternative way to do visual programming. So Scratch, you know, we have these block-based languages where it goes from one to the other. And in data flow, the idea is you have data coming in on one side, typically on the left, although it depends on the language, and it might flow to the right. And basically, as it flows along these, um, I don't know if I have the mouse, oh, I do. As it, as it flows along these, along these arrows, so maybe you have two inputs, and here they're going to get multiplied together, and then here it's going to get added together to another, another variable. This data kind of flows. And what's interesting about it is that um, you can easily trace for any value. You can go back in time. You can go back and see where it came from. You don't have variables that are changing in multiple places or anything like that. The whole thing is laid out, much like an electronics diagram, right? Um, and for, you know, and just as a side note, it's really interesting. This was not invented. Dataflow was not invented as a visual programming thing. It was actually invented as a, a completely alternative architecture for computers. Like the idea was that you would write in a textual programming language, but this would be translated internally into these kind of graphs. Um, and in fact, it wasn't, and, you know, like most, most of the really pioneering computer science stuff, this came from like the 1970s. It wasn't until much later that people realized that visually it actually was really interesting to think of a program this way. Uh, I just find that fun. So um, when we make, so, okay, finally I talk about red wire. Okay, that was all a prelude. Now, wh what did we do for the design of, of our system? So uh, we basically thought of it like, okay, we're going to take this electronics metaphor, we're going to run with it, um, and we're going to have these things called chips. And so chips are kind of like functions um, in a lot of programming languages, but with their, they're pure. And what I mean by pure is that they're not changing other stuff. So if you think about it like a chip, a chip has pins that are in and they have pins going out. But it's not doing other stuff. It's not changing other parts of the system that outside the pins. So if you look at a chip and you take it out, you're sure that it's not being used, right? It's very clear. And like anything, anything it needs is coming in input pins. Um, then we have a thing, we set up these switches, we set up, sorry, we set up these chips in kind of a hierarchy, like a tree. And we have them controlled by something we call switches that basically just say, okay, right now this one turns on, this one turns off. These ones turn on, this one's turn off. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more later. Um, and finally, this is the, the part of the system. So up till now we have these kind of pure chips that can only have inputs and we have outputs, but they aren't hooked up to anything, right? You can't, uh, you can't tell when the, when, the, when the player is pressing the keyboard or moving the mouse, and you can't send anything to the screen to draw, you don't do any sound. And this is where we have this idea of buffers that come in. 
So we basically, a buffer is basically just like a, a memory, like a set of memory. You can think of it as the memory in a, in a computer system, or you can think of it as, um, yeah, it's basically just like a set of information. And this, we have, we have two types of these buffers. One represents the memory for your entire, for your entire program. And another one represents the input and output. So the input is like, um, uh, yeah, the mouse, the keyboard, things that the player is doing. And the output is typically, well, graphics on the screen, uh, sound, uh, you know, network requests, anything else that you're basically interacting with, like the outside world, as we think of it. So it's only when you hook up the chips to the buffers that anything happens in the system. All right, so I'm just going to show really quickly, like, a conceptual idea of how these things can be linked up together. So. In this, in this type of example, we have, um, we have this chip that's called making a circle, right? So it's going to make a circle, and we give it two values, like a position and a radius, to, you know, to, to write a circle, and it's going to generate a shape. So this shape is just data. It's not, nothing yet is being drawn on the screen. But when I hook it up to the graphics uh, output buffer, that's when things start getting drawn. Okay, so this is not very interesting. You have a static circle on your screen. If you hooked it up, to the input buffer, then you can start doing more interesting things. So in this case, I've taken the position of the mouse, I've sent it as the position of the, of the circle, and now I'm drawing it on the screen. So if, if I showed this live, you would see kind of a circle following, following the mouse. So by the way, uh, why am I not showing you this in Redwire? Well, the reason is that unfortunately this is a conceptual model that we built and we were unable to really get this across in the interface. And that's something that was kind of a major drawback for our system. Uh, we'll talk about that a bit later. But, so that's why I'm explaining it with slides rather than uh, directly into the, into, in the program. Anyway, I could make a more complicated example where we're using memory. So here, for example, if you wanted to have an object just move across the screen all by itself, well, you need to store its position. So in something, a program like Scratch, you wouldn't do it that way. A sprite would just have its own position. And just by, you'd say it, oh, move, move here, you know, move to the left or something like that. And it would just do that. But in this system, we're saying, no, the chips cannot keep their own state. They can't do anything except affect their input and output pins. So we have to hook it up to memory. So we have this memory buffer that at the beginning of each frame is going to keep track of the speed and the position. And it's going to add them together in order to generate the position at the next frame. And that position is going to be drawn. Okay. I'll keep going, but if you have um, questions afterwards, I'm happy to, to go back into it. Okay. So um, maybe I will skip this in the interest of time and just go directly to a little demo. So uh, let's see. Hopefully this will work. And no. So there's something that goes wrong with the monitor apparently when I, when I shut off... Um, when I shut off PowerPoint, so I'll just switch back real quick. Oops. Okay, so if you went to Redwire uh, right now, so it's a redwire.io. Um, it's put totally, like I said, it's open source, available and everything. You get a little video that explains it and a list of some of the games that we've, that we've built. Um, and when you go afterwards, you can, you know, see some of the games, you get screenshots of them, little movies, and you can, you can search for what you want. So for me, uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a, a game called um, The Space Shooter that is here. So, you know, obviously you can play it. It's a, it's, a, it's a silly little game where, you know, you have a little spaceship, you fly it around, and you can shoot at these enemies that are coming at you, and you get stars in the background. So you can take any game you want, and you can remix it. So you click the Remix button at the bottom, and here you're loading up into Redwire. So this is what Redwire actually looks like. So here we have the ch different chips that you can use. Um, these all open up. Here you have your assets, different things that you can, the different pictures that you're drawing, or the, or the, or the video or audio that you're, you want to play. Um, this is the memory I was talking about, the positions of everything, uh, how much health you have, that kind of stuff. Um, and then here, finally, where the chips are laid out. So, um, you know, it's kind of like, it's an environment where you can go like this, you, you can play it, um, you can do a little bit, uh, let's see, what we can show. You can do some live coding stuff, so for example, uh, here I have a chip that's, um, let's see, what's a good example? What's one where we move? So here's the, here's the chip that controls our movement. So we can go in here and I can change the speed, for example, as it's playing, and now suddenly I'm moving super fast. Um, 
I can do something kind of cool called, called muting a chip. So basically, if you could think back to the electronics metaphor, I said it's really cool how you can kind of just take things straight out. So one of the things you can do here is you mute it. So and when you're muting it, you're just kind of taking it out. So for example, if I if I click here, uh, that's the chip that oops, that's the chip that that moves the lasers. So if I if I don't move them, I just shut it off, right? And I can unmute it, and they're all going to go. Um, we can do similar things with the way things are, are drawn. Um, so we can shut off, for example, if we don't want to see the spaceship anymore, we just kind of shut it off like that. Um, we can change the assets too. Like if we wanted to change the pictures, all we have to do is draw in a new picture, and it'll be it'll be uh, automatically replaced. I won't do that now because it involves kind of using two hands, which is <laughs> a little hard for me to do right now. Um, and, and finally, the last thing I, I really want to show you guys is is, is how the how the, how, how the replay works. So a, a really cool thing about the system is that we can we can have this record button and then we play. So what what it's doing is it's it's actually recording the. Um, it's recording all the everything that happened during the game, and when I click stop, I can now use this scroll bar and I can go back in time. And the reason I can go back in time um, is that I keep track of the state of all these buffers at all the time, and so that allows me a very nice way to keep track of the system at one point. There's no internal data that I need to keep track of. So obviously we can go back, um, and over here we see we see the memory. Uh, so at any point in time, so let's say for here. Uh, I can go here and I can say, well, um, okay, in this particular case, this is where the, my spaceship was. What would have happened if he was a little higher up? So here I'm going to go into the memory, I'm going to change it, and I'm going to say apply to recording. And when I'm going to do that, so he changed the position here, right? But when I replay, what's interesting is that everything else is going to happen as if I was there. So it kind of it allows you to do this what if kind of stuff. So it's like it didn't just record like the you know what my screen looked like. It recorded everything I did. So every time I moved, uh, I pressed the arrow keys. It recorded that. Every time I pressed the space bar to fire, it recorded that. So it allows me to go back in time, change the code, and then see what would have happened in these um, different cases. And that was very inspired by Brett Victor. If you've seen any of his demos, they're really fantastic. I and mean, that's what, one thing that we really wanted to accomplish with this system. Uh, and that part works fairly well. Maybe just one last thing I can show you is um, that's kind of cool is that you can see which chips are active at a time. So when, it, when a chip is green here, it means that it's being, you probably can't see the, the text of what's going on, but you, hopefully you see the colors. So if it's green, it means it's running right now in this frame. And if it's gray, it means it's not. So you can also track like when code runs. So for example, if we do it well and we get back to just when I fire, hup, I don't know if you'll see it. At some point, all of a sudden, up, oh, it turned green. So here they both turn green, and that's when it fired. So that's a really nice debugging feature. It you, helps you understand when a code, when a code is running and when it's not. All right, I think I'll stop the demo there um, and switch back to the presentation. And hopefully this will work. Yes. Okay. So we made a bunch of games with it. Uh, we did games around autism. We did games to teaching biology. We did games about teaching quantum physics. That was a lot of fun. Um, and this is probably our biggest game we're going on right now. It's a collaboration uh, with the Weizmann Institute and Harvard about studying creativity, where you move blocks around and you track where they're um, uh, basically how the kind of creative moves that people make when they're given a system. Uh, and that's available online also if you, if you want to play it. I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, and Getting back into the more kind of postmortem part of the talk, where I, you know, uh, where I whip myself for the different things we did we did poorly. So uh, good things that I was the parts that I was happy. So I'm going to categorize into three things: the things I thought worked really well, the things worked really badly, and the things I think we have, you know, uh, we could we could do, we could do better in the future. So. This idea of using these data-only interfaces, I was talking about like the memory and the, and the I.O. buffers, overall worked really well. I thought that was really happy. It allowed us to do all those kind of cool debugging features that we talked about, and we could have gone a lot farther than we did. Um, uh, the live coding stuff, the muting stuff, and most, mostly that time travel type of debugging worked really well. I'm very happy with that. On the bad side of things, we had, we had this idea that, oh, we don't need to build like a whole language. We're just going to let people program in JavaScript. And so many people know how to program in JavaScript. It's really cool. It's going to be lots of people that are going to be able to use it. Um, and this turned out to be actually a very poor idea because it turns out that, you know, if you already know how to program pretty well in JavaScript, then 
you might, it's hard to convince you to use a new framework, a new engine, when there's so much that exists out there. Um, and if you don't know how to program, then I'm asking you basically to learn a new system plus learn JavaScript on top of it. And that's, that's a hard sell. Um, then there was basically our next biggest problem, our, this idea that we had that we could automatically merge data together. So we're like, oh, we don't need to have like, data flow graphs are really complicated. You have to figure out what happens if two people write to the same pin at the same time. We'll have an automatic algorithm that does this. And that turned out to be very bad because, first of all, it's incorrect in some cases. And then in other cases, it's just very, very slow. And this created a big problem because our program, it runs fine on a, on a, on a laptop or on a desktop computer, but on mobile, it's, it's not at all fast enough. And so the kind of most recurring feature people kept asking us was, oh, I want to make a game, but I want to put it on a smartphone. Does it work on a smartphone? Does it work on a tablet? And we kept having to say, no, 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 no. And that was a big detriment to a lot of our games because you know, a lot of scientists, they want to reach people where they are. They're on their mobile. Uh, and that's you know, quite logically where they want to make their games. Um, and just in the final category, um, about the more promising part. The visual debugging stuff, I thought we could have gone a lot farther with that. Like, you know, we have right now, we can see which chips are active, we can see your memory, but we don't see the data actually flowing across these wires. And that's, I think, where the real power could get into it. Also, representation of numbers and stuff like that. Like, um, like they were saying in the Scratch uh, preview for 3.0 the other night, how there was that, you know, how when you had angles, you know, you have a little radial picker where you can pick what angles are. There's lots of stuff that you can do like that for data. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have that. It's just numbers, so it's a little bit, it makes it a little hard to visualize what you're talking about. Um, okay, so just a very quick section, because I'm running out of time, about the kind of things that I would like to do in the future. So basically, um, we realized through this that, you know, we thought we were just kind of building like a game engine and a framework, but in fact, what we were trying to do was build a language. Um, we we're trying to build a real visual language. And I, I kind of had resisted that idea because I thought, oh, it's going to be too complicated, it's going to be too long, and then, you know, people have to learn a whole new language. I think in the end, actually, it's the, it's the right decision. Because by building a full language, you have complete control over it. And in particular, we could do what languages do, which is compile down to things that are faster. So we're kind of having a vision that we could take Redwire and do a full out graphical interface and then, and then compile that down, you know, transform it into like a machine representation in JavaScript or something else that's much faster. And then we can run on mobile. And then we could do a lot of, get a lot of these features done that we really wanted. Um, we could also allow, we could also, like I said earlier, it was a little hard to get people to understand how the model worked. And I think ultimately our interface, it didn't really make that clear. Like I kept having to use, you know, slides and other kind of drawings to explain to people. It's nice if the interface explains the model in itself. And that's what I'd really like to change. Um, and I, I'll skip this in the, in, the, in the interest of time. And just a f final thought uh, on it, something I learned that I was not expecting so much is that, you know, obviously there are technical challenges whenever you're building a system like this, but the technical challenges were not at all the hardest. The hardest was the creating the community of people around it. Um, and so we, we actually tried quite a bit, like, you know, we had, we had hackathons, we had workshops, we did it in a summer school, but it was very difficult. We ran game jams and you know, things like that, but it was very difficult to create a community of people who really want to use it. And I'm very impressed, just to say I'm very impressed when I see how far Scratch has come and how far like, also projects like Snap and a lot of the other projects that are shown here have come, because they've really managed to succeed at creating this really great community of people who are passionate about it and use it. And that's what makes that open source project live. And that's, a, I think, for me, is the, is the hardest part. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to everyone at our lab who has worked on the project and uh, ask you if any questions. That's a very good question. Um, how long did we spend? I mean, overall it was about three years, but it wasn't full time at it. Like, I think we was probably about a year and a half of very active development. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is, um, a lot of that is figuring out what you wanted <laughs> in the first place. You know, you have these ideas and you, and you try them out and they don't really work. And then you have to go back and you iterate, you know, and that's, that's totally normal. That's the way things work. But it's not like, 
we didn't have the prior experience in order to like build on top of it. Like if we started now, we would be like, okay, you know, we've learned a lot of different things, and we're going to start from the lessons we've learned. <laughs> You're probably right. <laughs> it's a very good point. <laughs> Any other questions? So um, I, I once saw in, in a project, and they were seven years old even, and they took a game that was um, Space Invaders and Pong, and then they the first thing they did was sort of grab the Space Invaders and added it to the Pong game, so your, the paddle, I mean the ball would bounce off the Invaders and they were still coming down, but then they took the ability to fire to defend, you know, to shoot the space invaders and added it to the paddle so that now they had this game they were very proud of called Space Pong where they could, at the same time the, the Pong game was happening, the same paddle would also have to be used to defend against the invaders or something. And the reason they were able to do it was these games were, were designed very carefully to be very modular so that kids could pull them apart and put them together in different ways. But it sounded like that was one of your goals, but I wasn't quite sure if you kind of got there. Yeah, I, I thank you for that question. Um, I kind of glossed over that uh, to go like, fast. So basically, um, what we did for our remixing idea is we basically had the idea that you could take chips from anywhere in one project and you would drag a drop over into another window where you had another game. Um, and so that worked. But it was underdeveloped, I'd say. It's a little hard to say, unfortunately, which is kind of the you know, hypothesis of the project, is that part would work. It, it worked to the extent that we were able to grab over chips that were kind of near the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, and you know, it copied over the memory and everything related. But I guess there were two issues. One is that we didn't have a way to really take a part out of the middle. And it was just a technical thing. It wasn't. It was just a coding thing. We didn't have time to do it. I mean, there was no technical reason why it shouldn't work. Um, and the, Second issue, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, oh, well, there was a second issue, but I just forgot what it was. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, I can't think of it right now, but I'll, hopefully I'll remember later and I'll tell you what it was. Sorry. But to, I guess to make a long story short, like, so we, it was kind of underused. Like, we didn't, we didn't evaluate it enough to know if we really succeeded in, in doing Oh, yeah, okay. The second part was that if you're combining two different things, um, in most of computer science, the idea is that you can kind of update things continuously. Like if you have, you know, if you're using some, let's say, go back to my example at the beginning, if you have like a graphics library that you're using. Well, you know, they're going to go from version 1 to version 2 to version 3, and typically you want to you know, upgrade with them, right? But we never found a good way to do that here, because if you're remixing whole parts of the program, but then you're changing it, it's really hard to say, okay, you know, I want the new version, but then with all my changes applied, and that was kind of a, a barrier that we also never really figured out a, a good way around. I don't know if, if other projects maybe have found a solution to that, but uh, we, we didn't. All right, well, thank you very much.